um, to William, William Hussey, who is going to be looking at uh, the uh, Shostakovich's interpretation of, of, of Hamlet and of Julius Dean. So without, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again to all the uh, organizers of this conference and making this happen again. Let me get started. When Shostakovich agreed to compose the score to Grigory Kozintsev's film Hamlet in 1962, Kozintsev not only secured a talented composer with a worldwide reputation and a friend with whom he had collaborated many times, but also an avid reader of Shakespeare, whose words and subjects would inspire many of Shostakovich's compositions. Shostakovich was particularly fond of the film score to Hamlet, subsequently quoting one of the film's Ophelia themes in three compositions his Ninth String Quartet, and in two songs using Hamlet-based poems by Alexander Bloch and Marina Svetaeva. The nature of these pieces containing these quotations suggests several things about the composer's musical interpretation of Shakespeare's play and the character of Ophelia in particular. Today I hope to show how Shostakovich's quotation and development of Ophelia's theme in the quartet unearth distinctive and mu musical connections between Ophelia and Hamlet's music, suggesting that Hamlet's theme, considered to be newly composed, was actually derived from Ophelia's, a connection not apparent in the film score. Furthermore, the very nature of this derivation not only sheds new light on the compositional process, but also on how Shostakovich places Ophelia in a musically central position that defied common Soviet interpretations of the storyline. Such a placement, further reinforced by the selection of the Bloch and Svetaeva poems, provides new insight to Shostakovich's implicit empathy for Ophelia, which can only be heard in the musical development spanning several distinct works. In his work on Hamlet's film score, Eric Heine notes that Shostakovich's themes are directly associated with three characters, Hamlet, Ophelia, and the ghost of Hamlet's father. While Hamlet and the Ghost have their own distinctive themes, there are several melodies associated with Ophelia. When Ophelia first appears in the film, she is portrayed in Kozintsev's words as, quote, a sweet young girl turned into a doll, a clockwork toy with artificial movements and a studied smile. This clockwork theme, played by the harpsichord, shown as an, on screen as a lute, was, on, was the only music Kozintsev requested of Shostakovich before filming. The association between Ophelia and the harpsichord will be reinforced later in Shostakovich's music that accompanies Ophelia's descent into madness and death. Interesting, interestingly, most of the other Ophelia themes in the film score, whether played in the orchestra or sung by Ophelia herself, were not written by Shostakovich. Fiona Ford has documented the origins of these themes. Uh, William, we can't hear the sound. Okay, let me see if I can um, fix that. Hmm. Let me tell, me tell me if you can hear this. Of the several snatches of songs sung by Ophelia in Shakespeare's play, Kozintsev selected only three to be sung in his film, which in their original English begin, How should I your true love know? Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, and this single line, For Bonnie, sweet Robin, is all my joy. 
The unaccompanied songs are set to melodies traditionally used in productions of Hamlet at London's Theatre Royal Drury Lane since at least the 18th century and were first published in 1816 by William Lindley. The first English folk song mentioned here, How Should I Your True Love Know, reappears throughout Shostakovich's film score. Here is the version, a version of the original tune. And here is Ophelia singing the work in the film. This is the first time we see Ophelia after she has learned of her father's death at the hands of Hamlet, the man she loves. Unable to face the conflict between her paternal and romantic loves, she has descended into madness that will eventually lead to her suicide. These Ophelia themes reappear in the music Shostakovich wrote for Ophelia's tragic end, Q28, The Death of Ophelia. In this excerpt from the film, where Q28 is heard, we briefly see Ophelia's brother, Laertes, before the screen, before the scene then moves to Ophelia's empty bedroom as a solo violin plays the How Shall I Your True Love No tune. Later, we hear the harpsichord, the instrument to which Ophelia had danced at the beginning of the film, as the scene shifts to Ophelia's body underwater after her suicide. <laughs> follows next in the film, in Still in the Death of Ophelia Q, is significant in Shostakovich's score. The excerpt begins with a tolling bell for the dead girl, and we see a bird in flight, a symbol of Ophelia's departing spirit. We also see Hamlet, who is returning to Elsinore Castle, watch the bird from a distance. In the music, over cello and bass ostinato, we hear a slow dirge in the upper strings. Music in this excerpt is covered by sounds of the ocean, and in the film, the slow string dirge appears only once, but in Shostakovich's score, it appears twice. The second statement was evidently cut during editing. Here's the original music in the film score.
tune, How Should I, Your True Love, know that owes this cue. Again, the second and ending third. Later in the cue, we hear the slow string dirge, beginning with the same ascending and descending third, but in an augmented rhythm. The string dirge is in actuality a reference to and transformation of the English ballad Ophelia sang in her madness. The significance of the string dirge is not only that it is derived from the English ballad, but that is also quoted in the fourth movement of Shostakovich's ninth quartet. Let us listen to the original passage from the film again. Quotation in the quartet is almost identical to the original, with the eighth note accompaniment being replaced by oscillating quarter notes. Note how the quartet quotes the Ophelia dirge in the same key, in the same instruments, and in the same register. More importantly, the quotation in the quartet refers to the Hamlet film score, which in itself is a reference to the English ballad sung by Ophelia earlier in the film, and that may have been sung by Ophelia in the original production of the now legendary play. Why did Shostakovich choose to quote this transformed Ophelia theme in his ninth quartet? Perhaps the composer was unhappy that his haunting chorale was covered by extraneous noises in the film, a complaint made to the director on another occasion, or that the original passage in his score was cut in half in the film's final edit. While these circumstances may be the motivation for the quotation in the quartet, it is more revealing to explore how this quoted passage is developed in the subsequent music. After the quotation opens the quartet's fourth movement, two similar statements follow, one at rehearsal 51 and another at rehearsal 54. To save time, I'll play rehearsal 54 only. Here is a comparison of the three melodies. These later statements may be just expansions of the original, but the nature of this expansion is significant. The essential motion of the original quote from the death of Ophelia is the ascending and descending third. At rehearsal 51, the motion is reduced to a neighbor, but the third of the original quotation appears at rehearsal 54. The two later statements are similar in that both expand the quotation by adding the leap of a fourth before descending once again. The importance of this change to the original quotation is that it is a reference to another significant character from the film, Hamlet himself. To better understand how Hamlet's music relates to Ophelia's, we will look at the opening of the film where we hear the title character's music. In this clip, we see Denmark's castle, Elsinore, as black flags are being put on the battlements announcing the death of the king, Hamlet's father. As shown in the score, the music begins with harshly attacked chords in the woodwinds and brass, followed by a theme played by the strings and horns. Here is Hamlet's theme, as identified by Tatiana Yegorova, as it is heard primarily when Hamlet is on the screen. The sharply articulated chords that accompany the theme are considered by Yegorova to represent the sinister presence of Elsinore's castle, a symbol of the corrupt Danish court. As we look closer at Hamlet's theme, we see a striking similarity to the Ophelia's passage quoted in the quartet, both beginning with the ascending and descending third. 
While the intervals themselves are not exact, the distinctive contour is common to both. And given the fact that Shostakovich used the old English ballad representation, one of similarity might have been intentional. Where the two themes begin to differ is after the descending third. Ophelia's theme continues downward, whereas Hamlet's theme leaps up a fourth before descending again. The significance of this difference becomes clear as we look at the quotation in the quartet. Let us recall that the quartet quotes Ophelia's theme with the ascending and descending third, and that the two similar passages that follow seem to be expansions of the original quotation. When comparing the expanded versions to Hamlet's theme, we hear the distinctive ascending fourth and followed by a stepwise descent. Thus, we can see and hear how Ophelia's theme in the quartet is expanded to represent Hamlet's theme. Furthermore, the quartet features a distinctive restatement of this passage in the second violin. These pizzicato, triple, and sometimes quadruple stops feature the same contour as Hamlet's theme, but the timbre of the passage is, is reminiscent of the Elsinore chords that open the film. It seems that Shostakovich has taken a short passage of music that was associated with Ophelia and reshaped the quartet to demonstrate the affinity of the uh, Hamlet and Ophelia themes. The connections between these themes is only recognizable in the extended developed version of the quotation, a process not afforded Shostakovich in his film score that was under the control of Kozintsev. To take the conclusion further, perhaps Shostakovich conceived Hamlet's theme as a derivation of Ophelia's theme, as indicated uh, as, as an indication of the composer's own reading of the characters that emphasize the relationship of the two, placing greater importance on Ophelia's character. The interpretation in and of itself is revealing as to Shostakovich's own conception of the play and his score, but when considered in the light of Soviet ideological assimilation of the play and how Ophelia and Hamlet's relationship was reconsidered in the assimilation, Shostakovich's reading is very important. The party resolution of 23 April 1932 on the reconstruction of literary and artistic organizations ended the early Soviet era of relatively unregulated artistic production. Joseph Stalin, who sought a centralized control of the arts, as well as recognition by countries outside the Soviet Union, began a campaign to reinterpret pre-revolutionary artistic classics in the terms of revolutionary thought. William Shakespeare, extremely popular in Russia throughout the 19th century and highly valued by Western countries, was almost immediately implicated in the Soviet project of building cultural capital. Insisting on Shakespeare's role as a proto-revolutionary writer and appropriating his works as evidence that the October Revolution was historically inevitable, by the 1930s, Soviet ideology workers had fully launched what Arkady Ostrovsky calls Shakespeareization as a state policy for Soviet culture. In her recent work on Shakespeare's role in Soviet culture, Natalia Himienko explores the challenges faced in the assimilation of Hamlet into approved Soviet literary works, in particular the character of Ophelia. For Soviet writers and academics, the image of Ophelia as a pure and simple being was both aesthetically appealing and intensely familiar from the 19th century representations, both in Russia and in Europe. However, such an image also required an acknowledgement that Hamlet behaved reprehensibly towards Ophelia. In Soviet constructions, the suggestion that Hamlet is overly harsh, even deliberately cruel to Ophelia, would have clearly contradicted the ideological idealization of him. When Hamlet is understood to be a proto-socialist hero, neither recognition of his harshness nor subsequent sympathy for Ophelia is a desirable reader response. Citing scholarship on the play by Soviet critics, Himienka demonstrates Soviet efforts to redefine Ophelia and justify Hamlet's behavior towards her, with critics calling Ophelia a blind instrument of the Denmark court, justifiably condemned by Hamlet, and even a shameless feminine distraction to Hamlet's mission against corruption. In this light, Himienka addresses Kosintsev's film version of Hamlet. Kosintsev undoubtedly intended his Hamlet as a sharp repudiation of repressive social and political structures about to return at the end of the thaw. However, his film also absorbs the Soviet suspicion of Ophelia, reflecting the persistence of ideologically shaped reading practices from an earlier era. Recall how Ophelia first appears in the film in the clockwork doll dance with the harpsichord theme 
Himienka identifies Kuznetsov's initial representation of Ophelia as a remnant of the early Soviet dehumanization of Ophelia. Following the tradition of Soviet interpretation, Kostensev sacrifices Ophelia's humanity, transforming her into a wooden image of a girl with no potential for explosion. If in fact Shostakovich derived Hamlet's theme from Ophelia's tune, as the quartet, su quartet suggests, perhaps Shostakovich believed the young girl to be more significant to the story than what was commonplace in Soviet interpretations. Further evidence of Shostakovich's empathy for Ophelia can be found in two songs he set for poems of Alexander Bloch and Marina Svetaeva. These songs are notable not only for their reference to the Hamlet story, but also because they were written about the, after the film score, musically refer to Ophelia's theme, and were specifically chosen by the composer from the collective works of each poet, suggesting a desire to return to and to comment further upon the character. In Ophelia's song, setting the poem by Bloch of the same name, Ophelia rec um, recalls events that took place before the play. In particular, Hamlet's departure to study abroad and his promise of never-ending love, a promise he would break on his return to Denmark. When parting with your darling girl, friend, you promised to love me, my dear. Leaving for that hated land, you promised to keep your oath. The central theme of this poem, Hamlet's abandonment and broken promise, decries behavior by the Danish prince that Soviet critics avoided for their appropriate, appropriated revolutionary hero, and Shostakovich refers musically to Ophelia's theme from the Hamlet song, Hamlet score in the song. Recall the Ophelia theme from the string quartet transformed to represent Hamlet's theme, the opening, ascending, and descending third with an upward leap and scalar descent. In the block song, a similar passage occurs in measure 8 through 14. third song of Shostakovich's Six Poems by Marina Svetaeva is Hamlet's dialogue with his conscience. The poem is, as the title suggests, an internal conversation that takes place in Hamlet's mind after Ophelia's drowning. She's down there on the bottom, in the silt and weeds. She went there to sleep, but there's no sleep for her there either. But I loved her like forty thousand, and yet less than one lover. The poem emphasizes Hamlet's guilt at his treatment of the girl, a point decidedly avoided by Soviet reading of the play, but specifically chosen by Shostakovich from Svetaeva's writings. In addition, Shostakovich references the Ophelia theme used before, recall Rehearsal 51 of the Ninth Quartet. Shostakovich uses a similar passage in the introduction and conclusion of the song, extending the descent to match the image of Ophelia's body sinking to the mud. For Shostakovich, recollection of the film passage in these two songs in combination with the quotation in the quartet that reveals the affinity of the Ophelia and Hamlet themes retrospectively indicates the significance of the original film passage to the composer. His interpretation of Ophelia's importance to Shakespeare's story that had been so reduced in Soviet literary criticism. In addition, the reference to the Ophelia passage from the film score and three other works suggest that the composer was greatly affected by the injustice done to the young woman by Hamlet and disagreed with the Soviet minimization of her character. But in Soviet Russia, open disagreement was not possible without great risk, and although some have insisted that Shostakovich fragrantly openly and openly protested Soviet oppression, this has been challenged by many others. Nevertheless, in any totalitarian society such as the Soviet Union, where public dissent is forbidden, clandestine communication that is clear to a select few was valued. And for artistic works, Shostakovich found the inner meaning of a work, not its obvious surface, more important. 
Speaking in 1941, he stated it was this allegorical articulation that drew him to the works of Shakespeare. It seems to me that when one speaks of the magnitude of Shakespeare, then one needs to keep in mind the inner magnitude and the breadth of spirit, not the external pomp and circumstance. For Shostakovich, the inner magnitude of his empathy for Ophelia was less apparent in the film score than it was when the music he recalled in later works. And the inner magnitude of this music was the quality Kozintsev valued in the composer's film scores. Shostakovich's music. I would not be able to make a Shakespearean film without it. In Shostakovich's music, I can hear a ferocious hatred of cruelty, the cult of power, and the oppression of justice. This is a special goodness. A fearless goodness. Perhaps not a fearless goodness, for very few citizens of the Soviet Union were not afraid at some point or another. But Shostakovich was not silent. His hatred of oppression may have been steeped in metaphor, hidden among different works, couched in ambiguous language, but it was not unexpressed. His voice was, by necessity, beneath the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for fascinating uh, paper and all your work to combine all these, uh, these, these findings and motifs to, to illuminate some possibilities of his uh, thought processes. Uh, I know we're running slightly over time. Um, in, would it be better have a quick question and then move on without a break? What do you think? Or, yeah? Anyone for a quick question? Yes, Laura. Okay, thank you for uh, absolutely fascinating um, paper. Thank you. Uh, how much, collaboration did Shostakovich have in the creation of the score? Of course, once it was written, it was obviously in the director's hands. Do we know how much he um, was involved in the in the collaborative part? Quite a bit. They seem not only had they worked um, in on previous plays in which they Shostakovich did the music, but Kozintsev has written extensively and even included letters that he wrote to Shostakovich. And, and, and in addition, wrote about how Shostakovich would say, I like this, I'm thinking about this theme, I'm thinking about that. Um, and how the two of them seem to see a lot of the, uh, the play in the same way. Um, it's a lot of it is, is um, documented in Kozintsev's diaries, both about Shakespeare and time, and then a diary about Lear. So they, um, he, Shostakovich was on set when they were filming uh, uh, Hamlet. Later when he did King Lear, he was too ill to be on set but they did collaborate quite a bit. And sometimes Kozintsev saying, I want this kind of music and Shostakovich saying, okay, or Shostakovich saying, I'm thinking this kind of music and Kozintsev saying, okay, and that sort of thing. Thanks. Hi, uh, William, thanks for this um, wonderful paper. Hey, uh, pardon, pardon my voice. Um, this uh, theme, this, this sort of, uh, motive of Ophelia. Um, have you have you looked at some of the um, <clears throat> some of the other instrumental works and things? I'm thinking of some of the other quartets. There's a um, my thinking about um, Shostakovich's approach to motives in general is that they there's so there's lots and lots of overlap between certain themes and other themes. And I've always thought that this was kind of part of his artistic conception to, to create this kind of motivic ambiguity and this kind of, you know, uh, that, that uh, gives the, a lot of the writing a sense of multivalence and, um, um, and ambivalence. And this particular theme, um, I've, I've kind of traced, traced it through a lot of other works in a lot of other uh, um, kind of slightly different ways. I'm thinking of the fifth quartet, it resembles the, um, Ustvolskaya quote of the trio from uh, that's in that quartet, and and um, it acts in a in uh, cadential spots in the seventh quartet as well, and in subsequent quartets. And um, I'm wondering if you've uh, uh, kind of looked at some of those other um, uh, spots or thought about this uh, this theme as it relates to what I think uh, is a, a motive that appears in a lot of other work. Um, Kuhn talks about it as the as the hymn motive in the, the 
fourth quartet. So there we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's also present in in the suicide in the um that's in uh the fourteenth symphony, um, and it appears as an accompaniment in the in the fourth in the thirteenth quartet, which he quotes from King Lear. Um, the the up and down third appears a lot in the motive, so it is very um uh, present in quite a few works of his. Um, the connection to me was that when the string dirge happened. It happened in the same cue as the quotation of the um, of the How Should I Do True Love No tune, so it was easier to connect the two just in their proximity. Um, but yeah, it does appear quite a bit, um, so it's not just distinctive to to that that tune. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the sound issues in the beginning. It's my great pleasure to welcome Laura Kennedy.